when you look a little bit at this picture you see here, this is probably a déjà vu for many of you. These places, they all look the same, and it's called the Ikeaization or McDonaldization of the landscape. And what is interesting about them is that when you look at the social signature of these areas, is that there's a lot of problems in these areas, there's a lot of crimes. And what is also interesting is that these are the areas which grow the fastest. When we talk about urbanization, this type of area is what is changing the fastest. And what we also know from the literature is that these areas have an effect on people and that people lose, if they are exposed to these places, they lose their so-called place attachment, their attachment to the place, and ultimately also the place making. And place making, I'll talk about it more in this presentation, is the feeling of care for the place and also the participation in that place. So how can I as a person become active and try to change that place? And what we know from the literature, interestingly, you will see today, that this has kind of been proved by the methods we have tried to use, which are methods you probably have never heard that you can really use them to do this, which are kind of these liar detector, which we put on fingers and we try to find out how the people feel. So in that sense, we are kind, we have kind of a, a vicious circle. We have these globalization processes, which change the diversity of these places. These places look the same, not just only because we have a fast growth of these places, but also because we have same materials. We have a lot of migration going in into these places. And the effect is a change in the attachment of these places, which at the end influences, as I said, place making. <laughs> so the idea is to really understand, is there a possibility here to reverse that vicious circle. Because if we continue <coughs> to have this, if we have a loss or a uniformization, we again have a loss in place attachment and loss in place making. Pe people are not going to interact with that place, and this is going to go forever. So it's a question, can we reverse this situation to have people more attached to the place and to have them more motivated to change that place? So when I talk about place, the question is, what is place? And I don't know if you know Jane Jacobs. Maybe that's something for a social scientist, a person you know. Um, she was a person who really investigated what is really place. And what is interesting is that this whole topic of place emerged at the same, at the same time as these places which had no real definition emerged. So parallelly to these places which were not really defined as, they needed some new concepts about their preferences for these places. So we tried to qualitatively understand with these survey what is the place and we tried to ask questions, trying to understand if these people were intentionally motivated to change that place. And what is interesting is that you can go through this web, if you want, you can open this web page here and you will see all the results, is that these places, even if we ask them, the image of the place gave us some details and some understanding about what is place making. So the perception of the place gave us an understanding of, and I'll come back to place making, about this intention of the people to participate in the place. And you can see that this place making is very much dependent on the function, the form, and the image. So that was for us already quite interesting is to see, well, it seems like we really have another, people are different, and their intention to modify the landscape is different depending where they are. So we tried to create a 
concept and to try to prove that we had a new concept about placemaking. And this is a latent variable analysis because it's very difficult to measure. I, it's like if you would ask people, are you intelligent? They will not be able to tell you if they're intelligent or not. It's like, do you do placemaking? People are not going to be able to tell you if they do placemaking. So we had to find variables to explain what placemaking is. And the variables were based on the literature you saw before about place. And we said, OK, can all this literature tell us something about placemaking? And the, this literature was transformed into different questions, which we asked when we uh, showed these pictures. And what was interesting is that the theory you saw before about place, this form, function, and image, which is something which exists since a long time in the literature, has been observed, but was overruled by something which is process, person, and place. And I would like to go into detail because it's very relevant for placemaking. Place, we've heard about it. Place is what you see here. It's, it's a, a location, which is a form, a function, and an image. But placemaking will very much depend on yourself, on the person, and on the process. Are you allowed to do place? Is it, is it possible for you to do a place? Can you participate in placemaking? Do you have the means to participate? Do you have the freedom to do something? Okay. Oops. No, not. So, um, so the interesting thing is that we could see that this new concept was explained across all these participants. We had all these different people, and we could create a concept out of these 7,000 people we had asked, and these three areas came out. What is also interesting, if you look at other literature about urban transformation, you can see that these are the three parts which are kind of the levy of urban transformation. If you want to change something, if you're a planner, and you want to change something, you will have to think about these three things. One is place. You can change something by added ele adding elements. You can add trees. You can add a new bus station. You can do something practical. On the other hand, it's very much dependent on your political sphere, on your governance, the institutional sphere. And that the most difficult part is it's very much going to be dependent on your worldviews, on your beliefs. So these three spheres of transformation, which you can also find in other literature, for example, O'Brien, which are spheres which talk about how can you transform, for example, a space, or how can you, for example, uh, change uh, your, your behavior, are very much linked to these three levels. Most difficult is the personal sphere, then comes the institutional sphere, and what is easiest is usually the practical sphere. So interestingly, we could see here that this placemaking effect was reflected in a concept which is very similar to what we see in other literature. So to summarize what I understand at the place making, place making is a process of which places emerge. So in other words, you try to put the boundaries so that the places which provide you a certain experience are going to emerge. So this is how I will define place making. And what is interesting is now that you will see that this placemaking itself is very different depending where you are. And you can measure it when you measure how the people emotionally are when they look at a place. When we talk about city of difference, I just wanted to show that, of course, we also asked all kinds of sociodemographic uh, information to these people and we asked them we asked them to rate these pictures and we wanted to also understand how is it related to your personal characteristics and what was also quite interesting is to see that how long you spend in a certain area so your attachment and how much you recreate in the area which is also has been shown is really dependent is going to explain this engagement 
into a certain place. Also education and the children in household. But what you also see is this is quite low. It's quite a low. I mean, R square of 0 0.0 and 25, you don't want that. So you will see also another same experiment with less people. And you will also see that this is kind of a concept which is across different people. It's not very well explained by the characteristics of the person. So do these different places really trigger some other responses in placemaking? That's the question we asked. And as I said, we're using some cognitive psychological experiment. For that, we need different techniques. So on the one hand, we need to create a visual stimuli. So we, we create a picture where people are immersed into that picture. What is good is that we can manipulate it. And that's important because then we know what we have changed and we know why people change their reaction. Then you see here that we measure how they sweat. And we also measure their heart rate. And you can, of course, you are a social scientist and you know how difficult it is to get the ethical uh, allowance to do this. It's usually not that easy. And especially when you see some weird stuff on their, um, on their heart rate um, signals, it's usually also quite problematic. And we use some um, figures, which are called SAM, I'll come back to that, to understand the signal. The signal just gives you if people are aroused or not, but it doesn't tell you if they are happy or unhappy. So we need something else to tell if the, what they feel is also related to a positive or a negative emotion. The experiment, we wanted to understand if um, this placemaking was really different in different areas around the world. And that's why we at least wanted to have two different countries, because we thought probably it's going to be different if I'm in the Netherlands, it's going to be different than if I'm in Switzerland. So we took two sets in Switzerland, and we took two sets in the Netherlands to try to find out if we had some differences. We took an urban, a rural and peri-urban, and of course, we mix and we tried, we calculated then how, many, how much green is in an area, how much buildup is in an area, etc., to be able to reference the different pictures, uh, which can be then done because, of course, we can manipulate. So, we, in the case we had a little bit more green, we changed the green to ungreen, etc. This is shown into, um, a, with, into glasses, so these goggles you can see here. So this person has this goggle, and what is also important is that this person will hear the sound of the area. So it's not just related to seeing something, but also hearing the neighborhood. And it's difficult to get people to come to your place, so we go to the place, and we have a little bus here, which we transformed into a little lab, and so we go into the neighborhood and we invite people to sit in the bus. It's always a problem to ask people, can you come in my bus? It depends who asks that, so <laughs> that's not always that easy to do. So on the one hand, we measure, as I said, the electrodermal activity, and we will show these little pictures, these self-assessment mannequins, and then we have a preference, a normal questionnaire, which is the same questionnaire that we got in this large survey, so the same questions, so it's a nested uh, uh, experiment, and we ask again about preferences, we ask about these adjectives, which you can see in the period viewer if you want to look at them. You, uh, we have some um, theoretical question about, uh, about, uh, uh, about place and place attachment. We have question about social cohesion, place making, and of course the sociodemographic of the people. How this works is that um, you first sit with these glasses and during four minutes you hear some monks singing. It's uh, just to bring them all to a certain level because every one of you is going to have another baseline. And then we first ask them how they, what's their uh, 
self, and so they, it's uh, how they feel, uh, if they feel unpleased or pleased, or if they calm or aroused. This is, these uh, little pictures here have been tested in really a lot of time. This is kind of the Bible of the cognitive psychologists. They ask, they've asked these in all kinds of situations, and they are validated pictures which they used to find out about more or less pleased and more or less excited. So these are the two, um, uh, two levels, the balance and the arousal, which are important indicators of your, of your uh, psychological state. And so we ask them about their sound, and then we show them a natural scene here, and then we start with, these, with the experiments. We show them different pictures. Of course, we will randomize the pictures so that not everybody sees the same, um, the same picture after one another. And these are the cells here. They can click with, these, with this machine. They can click on what they uh, feel. What do we measure with the fingers? We measure what you see here. It's a time series. It's kind of complicated to analysis, so we an analyze time series. And what we see here are two signals. One is the phasic. This is kind of the erection you have. It's uh, much shorter, and it's something you just get as an information in your brain. And the tonic is already, when you have in your brain, you, you um, the, you process this information in a tonic signal, which is something which is much lower. It's under the curve, and it's a, it's a, a much lower signal already um, filtered by your cognitive understanding. So it has a part, just not just a reaction, but it will respond a little bit to, have you seen these pictures before? Does it, do you remember about something? Do you have memories about these places? At that point, this comes into play in this signal. What we look in these signals, because sorry to come with all these details, but you will see the results afterwards. So what you see here are these uh, signals. What we look at is the sum of these peaks. So how many erections they had, kind of. The slope, so did they calm or did they got aroused when they saw the picture, and when does it begin? So how high, when they see the picture, what is their first signal according, compared to the natural scene? And we do this for the tonic and the phasic scene. The questionnaire, as I said, we have some objective, so rating scale, we have the theory of, I don't know if you know Kaplan, does that ring a bell? Have you ever heard about Kaplan? If you talk about landscape, landscape, there's a lot of theories about how landscape can be read. Um, there is questions about legibility. Can it be understood? Is it mysterious? Is it complex? Or is it coherent? And what is interesting is some of them are one-to-one -one related to a phasic signal, so something emotional you just get, and something which is more related to the tonic signal is as soon as you have to, um, to think about the legibility, you start to have your brain activated. For example, the coherence is something which is very much related to the phasic signal because uh, you just see it and it's either coherent or not. And this has been analyzed by a lot of researchers to find these relationship between pictures and these concepts here. Then we have neighborhood attachment questions, we have social cohesion questions, we have these place-making questions I showed, and we have the socio-demographic questions. So let me come to the results about the valence. The valence is, as we saw, is how pleasant this whole uh, thing is. And you can see here again, we have the urban, we have here the rule, and here we have the peri-urban. And I have to say, when I submitted this proposal, I had no idea that this would work. But it pretty much, it's pretty interesting. I mean, we have here 390 um, participants. And it's statistically quite significant that this peri-urban has a negative, is 
unpleasant in that sense. What we also see here with the arousal, it doesn't, it's, it doesn't really arise you. Again, the periurban has a quite a negative rise of your emotion. It doesn't really seem to lead to uh, excitement. And if we organize this according to a model of emotion, this is kind of a very classical cognitive psychological model, you can see where our landscapes are, orient, are, are located. You see here the periurban area, which is around the unpleasant and very boring. And you see here the urban and the rural, both, which are more exciting, they are pleasant. So that was the first very, we were quite uh, happy to have these results. And then we thought, okay, well, now we get to the second part, which can even be worse, because now we measure these uh, emotions, and we see the same picture. What you see here is the phasic and the tonic signal of the periurban area is the lowest. So it really seems, beside the people having clicked on that thing, that it's not really triggering any emotion. Being the short emotion or the long term, the cognitive emotion. It's very low and it's significant over all these people. We looked also at the slope, so how fast the people um, reacted. We also looked at the area under the curve. There are different measures to look at. And we looked uh, at both in the phasic and the tonic. And they all show a significant signal between, so peri-urban low and urban and rural, which have certain characteristics much higher. Here you see again these results, you see the phasic slope, the tonic sum, and you see again how the urban and the rural is much more important than the peri-urban. We then ask ourselves again, so what explains this? And as you saw, we asked many questions about what are the characteristics of these uh, and what are the concepts behind it. And what was interesting is that when we made a regression trying to explain placemaking in the rural areas, we saw that rural areas or this placemaking is very much related to the social cohesion. It was very much related to your emotional part, you can see here. And when we go to the urban, we see that place attachment plays a big role. Again, the emotional part and the social cohesion. And when we go to the peri-urban, we lose this, and the only thing which plays a role is the place attachment. So that's also quite interesting to understand how you can explain. So the emotional part is not explaining placemaking anymore in peri-urban area. It seems like place attachment plays a role. So if you have been a long time in these I mean, I grew up in one of these areas, and uh, I, I feel pretty happy. I, I don't know, I go home, I still go home. And I think this is what you see here. It's still a place attachment. But compared to the other, it seems like there is really a low emotional factor, and also the social cohesion. And I think this is, I mean, you see it too. It's kind of the truth. I, I th I've never really, I played with my children around the, just the people just living two houses around us. But I never really had an interaction, and my parents neither, with the, really the people of the whole place. And it seems like this is quite interesting that these things are explaining what we see. Again, the sociodemographic. Uh, you can see that social cohesion plays attachment, play a role. But again, we have the neighborhood, how long you have been in the neighborhood, the recreation and the education, again, come out here, even if it was a very different setting of the experiment. I mean, the experiment was very, very different. The one was online. This one was, we were talking with people. And we see that we have the same, uh, the same result. You see here that it's 
explaining much better because we have now these social cohesion and place attachment. So uh, in summary, uh, I don't know if I'm, I'm allowed to say that, but we have the impression that this result showed is that most people select to live in peri-urban areas, which is true. I mean, this is where the people go at the moment, despite the fact that they have negative emotions related to it. So it's very much driven by economic factors. And what we see is also that various places trigger different emotional re responses. And peri-urbanization leads to lower emotional responses and it's also related to lower place attachment and lower social cohesion. And of course, that depends on how long have you been at that place, what is your experience with that place, and what is also your education. So what does it mean for this vicious circle? I think we can learn quite a lot on where to trigger, where to try to change this, um, the, the quality and the well-being of the people living in this area is really to tackle placemaking. I think if we are able to increase the social cohesion, if we increase the place attachment, and increase this relationship between people and place in terms of their form and functions and the perception, I think we can foster placemaking. However, we're not totally sure. So what we're doing at the moment is we're trying to find out, so now that we know what are the elements of this placemaking, we're trying to find out, is that really what the people talk about when they plan? So we use this same concept and we created a series game. And the series game has exactly these three dimensions. So practical is what you can really change. I told you about you can add trees, you can build like higher up, you can densify, etc. Then we have political stuff, which is related to the process, institutional information, barriers, institutional barriers, you owe money. Uh, you get, for example, subsidies to do certain things and you have your beliefs and values. So how the person thinks and what are its, uh, their arguments. So we've set up this game. We've set it up in, uh, in uh, two cities in Switzerland and also in Helsinki, in another city to have a comparison. I don't have the results yet, unfortunately, to present you today, but just to show you how such a serious game can be operationalized. So you see here the game, it's in, a, in a, a 2D game, and you have these components, form, function, and um, image. Uh, image is very low because, and we'll see why, we have, a, the image is very difficult, it's very difficult to understand. This is their neighborhood, and it's very difficult to understand, and we'll, I'll show you how we make the image more understandable. And so we operationalize these elements, and we have these the actors playing around, and we try to understand what are the factors of the transformation. So what are the factors fostering the transformation and what are the factors which are hindering the transformation based on this O'Brien transformation sphere and the one which is very similar, as I showed you, to our conceptual background. And you can see here, and I don't know if it works, so we created the game in 2D and we also created the game in a, in a 3D situation where you can play uh, online and they are playing tonight the first time with this platform. This is uh, again the same technique we used for making the picture. So it's exactly the same information. They are point clouds based on LiDAR data and these elements are just objects you can place in the landscape and the users can just place the landscape and they discuss about the rules and we code afterwards the rules and or what they say and we try to understand what are the factors of transformation. More about that will be after um, this presentation. So thanks a lot. And you can ask in French, it's no problem. Uh, thank you so much for this really interesting
presentation, and we can't wait to see what happens with the, this new experiment. Now we would like to invite Eric Kidnap to present the So, I have what, five minutes? Uh, Ten? Uh, Half an hour. Half an hour. <laughs> okay, good. Thank you, thank you Adrienne, for those, this very innovative, uh, methodologically speaking, uh, conference. As I told you, I'm not an urban sociologist or environmental sociologist, so I'll make my comment uh, from a kind of methodological perspective and also like general sociology. Um, yeah, that's, uh, that's a very interesting talk in terms of methods because it, um, it joins like more like questionnaire kind of uh, research with experimental data and I think that's uh, very innovative and uh, it actually brings very interesting contrast between the result you got from the questionnaire and the result you got from the experiments, basically. I was expecting that experiments would work much less than questionnaire, and then you got the opposite, so that, that's the first <laughs> question. Has it uh, like surprised you, this result, or not? Um, I'm still wondering, actually, what is are the samples that you have worked with, you haven't said a word about who you interviewed, basically, yeah. in what condition, were those uh, representative samples or uh, like specific samples. I noted that you got uh, parents with children in there. Um, so, in sociology, you are very much focused on the, like, the sampling yeah. issues. And so if you could provide us a little bit more information on that, that would be great. Um, another question I had was about the dependent variables. So you had this, uh, like, uh, placemaking in three dimensions according to uh, your um, your um, uh, uh, factor analysis or yeah uh, thing. But I didn't get what was the 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 the, the variable at the end. Is it a mix of the three dimensions, or uh, or um, would you like rather not do a sp specific analysis on the three dimension separately or not? Mm -hmm. That was a, 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 a question I had. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, as a then general sociologist, I'm very much interested. Uh, I think that uh, my colleagues and the students as well are about the effect of social cohesion. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because uh, social cohesion is something that in sociology, uh, strangely, we don't use so much currently. It, it has a strange... Okay. I mean, it's, it's a very broad concept. Yeah. It can be measured in many, many different ways, yeah. in terms of social relation, in terms of trust, in terms of, uh, yeah. I don't know, economic uh, inclusiveness, uh, um, yeah, participation, social participation, basically. Uh, um, it's one of the uh, uh, concepts which is at the origin of our discipline with Durkheim. Yeah. But at the same time, we, we are a little bit hesitant to use it sometimes because we, it, it has a normative flavor. Uh, basically, we have a, like cohesive neighborhoods, non-cohesive neighborhoods, or cohesive countries, non-cohesive countries. We, so, how did you measure uh, social cohesiveness? And uh, another question. Uh, and then, uh, no, but I'm, I'm almost done. I'm almost done. Uh, uh, why didn't you uh, insist so much on social cohesiveness at the end of your talk? Because it seems to me that it's a very important uh, result of your research to show that this social cohesiveness actually has a, has a lot to do with uh, placemaking, if I understood you, you, your purpose right. So it, it's an important result. Uh, shouldn't you like do your serious games also on that dimension of uh, like improving trust in the neighborhoods or uh, I don't know, participation? Or, 
or whatever. And then I had a, a, a last comment about your uh, causal modeling, the, the first that you started with. Yeah. Um, it goes one way, can it go the other um, way around? Or uh, you have the, this conceptual part. Yeah, you have the arrows that yeah, goes yeah, from yeah. yeah from place attachment to place making and then to diversity of peri-urban landscapes. Yeah. I guess it can go also the other way around or, or not. Or you you okay. tell us. Okay. In any case, it was it was a very inspiring <laughs> talk for for us sociologists, I guess. Thank you. Okay, well, thanks a lot for all these questions. So, um, for me, it was also this proposal, I have to say, was a little bit a new step in a totally new methodology I had never used. And we had to learn a lot. We had to learn a lot to mix methods, etc. And um, we tested the method on something which we knew would be even more, um, would show even more results. That was the acceptance of wind power mills. So with the, the windmills, you see. And we've done a large experiment in Switzerland to understand the acceptance of a renewable energy in different landscapes. And we saw that this works quite well. Uh, we saw that people are really, and we could show very similar things, uh, people living at one place, and, they and the stuff you know, the people recognizing their own neighborhoods, they will say, I don't want it here. And the other ones who said, oh, this is far away from my home, I don't care. Let's have uh, the Ticino, let's have the Ticino full of, uh, we had also uh, uh, PV, like uh, uh, solar panels on open areas in the Ticino, people in, the, in Bern, they were like, I don't really care about that. So um, we thought probably we can see something, it seems like the method is telling us something, and there is a big um, science in cognitive psychology who is using that, met that method to understand emotion. So there's a big, uh, I would say since the 70s, there's a, a, a big research part which is trying to understand which part of the brain are activated. So they usually also do fMRI, so they, they scan the brain and they look, depending on what they see or what happens, at which part of the brains are getting linked. So many of these uh, link between concept and the signal are based on studies which have been done in a very different uh, research and the science, I'm not, I, I'm not doing that research. So I'm using kind of the understanding of what happens in the brain, which has been tested really on putting people into the machine and trying to see where their brain are activated. And I'm using just the signal, which is known to be the one of the best signals. There's, there are some other ones, the heart rate, works okay, but there's a lot of other signals in the heart rate and it's very difficult to, uh, to present because there's a lot of things and uh, it's, uh, it, we had people then get all nervous when you measure their heart and then there's uh, also you can measure about how they, how they look and what we also tested, we like, as I said, we are little geeks, we, we put them glasses on and we look where they look on the picture so we can say exactly how long they have looked at this part of the image and we can analyze how many pixels they looked and we can link that to where their emotion comes from in general. So in general, uh, it was for us quite amazing that this worked and that we could see such a nice signal. I really didn't expect it. Um, so that's maybe the first answer. Um, uh, I didn't expect it. Maybe coming to the whole project as well, is that uh, we wanted to have this more active place concept, not this passive place attachment, which has been investigated for many years, place attachment, sense of place, etc. We really wanted to understand this engagement because our, the idea was about urban transformation. So how can you transform a place? What do we need to do something? People are not doing anything. They're just, things just happen. If you look at our cities, things happen, it seems. And people are just, they live there, and we see it too, they live there because they have cheap arrows, they have no choice. So they're not really, um, they, they have no choice, and we are, not pre we are not giving them the choice to choose where they could be, and maybe we should do that, understanding that, to have more place making. So that, that was a little bit um, the, the idea, and we first had to create this, concept because that doesn't exist. So that's why we did this large survey. 
Then coming to the um, issues about the survey. Uh, the, the first thing you asked is about, um, I have to think about, the first question was about the... The structure of your uh, factorial design. Exactly. So this one. Eh? Mm -hmm. You asked how we created that and how did these three concepts come out and what does that mean? So we had, at the start, we had 32 questions which were collected from all these place research. There is a large, I don't know if you know Levica and people like this, there was a large, um, there's a large literature on these questions. And we had the hypothesis that we would recognize form, function, and image, what has been shown in the literature. But we didn't. We didn't in that sense. We really found these three um, parts. And um, it's, uh, we were, at, at, at the beginning, we were a little bit uh, disappointed, I have to say, that we didn't find what we expected. But on the other hand, looking at it more into detail, I have to say, it's probably really what we wanted to look at. It's this place making, and the um, what, what we see here are really good. We haven't tested it at other places, but we have tested it in this uh, in this uh, experiment. These are the factors. The these are with the confirmatory factor analysis what we found out, and uh, this is how these different questions feed into into these parts, and. Uh, yeah, we, we just took it as it is. I have, in that sense, I, um, I have to say it's not perfect. It, I think it needs more work. Uh, I think we could add, we should add questions probably, uh, because it's, uh, it's 0 0.85 or something like that, the whole explanation, which is not bad. Um, but of course, we, we could probably add some more factors and we could redo it in another place. But uh, for us, it, it made sense in terms of uh, the concept of placemaking. So we took out of these, the, these uh, literature on place, these three, this is where we took all the questions. And we cleaned them up based on all these questions. And if you want to look, um, I have the, for, from all these studies, I think there were like, I don't know, 80 studies, we, we took all these questions. And, and tried to have uh, sets of questions which were not repetitive, and that's how we created this set of questions. Really with the idea of finding something different. But then yeah? you, you use the three factors, uh, like a summary of the three factors in the regression? Or no, but these are all the questions. So we had 32 questions, mm -hmm. and the 32 questions, we, uh, we did a complementary factor analysis, mm -hmm. And these are the groups which came out, out of these questions. And then the groups were quite, I mean, uh, and if you look, uh, this was about home, leisure, density, nature, design. This was about uh, upkeep, initiative, safety, participation, and their view, walkability, recreation. I can give you the, we, we put, of course, the labeling here. But it's really based on, on the type of question. And I think the labeling was, was quite, made quite sense. We could have changed the word process to procedure maybe a little bit better. That's something we're thinking at the moment, but that's how we created it. If you want to see the question, give you a question. So that's, that, that respond a little bit to... Yeah, I wanted to know then in the regression analysis that you presented yeah. later on, yeah. uh, which variables were you were using? Actually? So at the end, we mm -hmm. added so place, person, and process okay. have all, so we added, uh, we summed the placemaking questions. It's just the sum. Of all items? Yes, of all items for okay. placemaking. It's a sum of all items. Okay. We didn't weight them. Okay. We could have, maybe you could have said, oh, I wait, I do these three, and then I sum them. We didn't. Or you could have made like separate progression for we each thing that I mentioned. Yes, no? we didn't, we haven't done that yet. Mm. Yeah, that's a good point. Mm. Yeah. And then what did you ask? <laughs> no. It's a sample. I think oh. that the students are 
the yeah. sample of uh, how we selected the people. Yeah. Okay, so uh, for this large survey here, we uh, had a panel survey, a representative panel survey for the Netherlands. Mm -hmm. And we paid, we paid a company. So this is uh, these 10,000 where just it's a representative panel survey of the population of the Netherlands. 10,000 people. 10,000, yeah, it's huge. Wow. Yes, it's really, it's really huge. So you had a lot of money to do that. We had a lot of money. Yeah, I got this URC grant. I had to spend it for someone. <laughs> no, it's true, I had a lot of money. Okay. Yeah, it costed quite a lot yeah, for us. Yeah. It was not a very long survey. Mm -hmm. Um, so that was that made it a little bit cheaper. Mm -hmm. It just when it, it just takes ten minutes or something like that. You just have to rate, and then you have a few questions. So it's quite short, but we had a lot of people answering. And uh, the selection of the people, the selection of the pictures, were um, were uh, also took quite a while to have to clean them all up uh, because they were first created automatically, and then we had to clean them up so that you wouldn't see people and uh, etc. and activities. Yeah. Uh, and what was the next question? <laughs> um, cohesion. Social cohesion. Yeah. Ah, social cohesion. Okay. So I have to say, I'm, as I said, I'm not a social scientist. So we knew that out of what we had read that social cohesion would be important. So we took, we thought, we'll add social cohesion, we probably have to. And in a pretest, we saw that social cohesion is quite important, and so we kept it. But it's absolutely true. If I would have to do it, I would do it much more into a better understanding. And I think in Diff Herb, we have uh, the possibility now to look at the social network, um, in that, uh, and also the connection between people. How many friends do you have, and all these things, mm -hmm. with this friendship survey, Kayakshausen is going to do. And mm -hmm. we hope to replace what we have here by something which is much more, they have like a, a generator of who do you talk to and where do they live, what okay. do they do. So that should be replaced by something which has, is much more meaningful mm -hmm. than the few questions mm -hmm. we used, which of mm -hmm. course are kind of, I would say, just the first a first idea, and maybe the yeah. results did change. So it then you can scale up your measure of social cohesion up, up, up to the level of the yes. of your other yes. measurements if you have social network methods. In exactly. The, uh, yes. And we really also want to have place attachment even better. At the moment we have just the, the typical place attachment mm -hmm. questions, but to have many different questions for the same place at attachment dimension, because there is sense of place, place identity, and all kinds of other concept. So that's something we'll try to uh, do better. But of course it's really first, yeah, first uh, idea. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you for the question. <laughs>